Chapter 9, slides 35 to 53. The last mechanistic motif we're going to cover in this chapter for the reactions of alkenes is SYN4. Now this is very similar to SYN3, except we're going to be adding two atoms across the pi system. Remember in SYN3 we added one atom, forming epoxides or um, cyclopropane or a bromidium or mercury bridge. This case we're actually adding two atoms across the carbon-carbon pi framework. So in some of these, we're gonna find out that a workup may be necessary in order to obtain that final neutral product that we're aiming for. But again, the operative word here is sin. Just like sin three, we're going to be adding these atoms across the pi system from the same face, or sin. How might we model this reaction with our hands? Because again, we're dealing with the alkene, which is an sp2 hybridized carbon system, we have a trigonal planar framework to contend with again. So these atoms can either add from the top or bottom face, as you saw with the hand model. Let's start our first one. The first one we're going to cover is hydrogenation. This requires the use of hydrogen gas as your reagent, and in order to get the gas to interact with the pi system, we have to entice it somehow. Remember, our pi system is our nucleophile. So the first bond we're going to make, right, uh, from an electron formalism standpoint is we're gonna use the alkene as our nucleophile. But hydrogen gas, if you just tried to bubble hydrogen gas into the alkene, I mean, there's really nothing polar about H2, right? I mean, H2, nothing polar about it. So H2 is a very stable sigma bond. It's not gonna react readily with the alkene. So you need a metal catalyst to get this reaction to go. And what happens is, is that depending upon the metal catalyst, certain catalysts, um, palladium, platinum, lithium, uh, sorry, nickel, um, these catalysts, adsorb hydrogen to its surface. So what happens is, is you have some sort of metal serving as your catalyst. And over time, the hydrogen would ad will adsorb to the surface. The metal will make a bond with the hydrogen and this sigma bond will break this is what gives you the black surface of the metal, that's the black balls in the representation below, with all of these hydrogens off of it. This is the same type of technology that we look at for hydrogen um, cars. You know, if you wanna use hydrogen as an energy source, you don't wanna store the hydrogen as a gas. So what you do is you store the hydrogen on the metal surface and you want that to be reversible. You would like to release the hydrogen so that when you need it as the fuel, it gets released from the surface of the metal. So this hydrogen adsorption ability onto the surface of metals is a quite commonly studied uh, phenomenon. So we, we want the metal to absorb the hydrogen gas, and once that happens, then we can start delivering the hydrogen to the alkene. So let me make room here for the chemistry that's going to occur. Let's pick a metal. Let's pick palladium, okay? So what's gonna happen is the palladium, which has a hydrogen off of it, is going to form a new bond with each carbon. So let's draw the electron pushing for this. Let's say that the double bond makes um, a bond with the palladium because palladium is a metal, so it's partially positive. So the nucleophilic pi system attacks the palladium and the palladium releases one of its bonds with hydrogen to form the other carbon-hydrogen bond. This gives us 
hydrogen and palladium having been added across the system. Now, this is the SIN4 that I was speaking of. We do have this carbon palladium, you know, bond intermediate. And ultimately, the palladium has more hydrogen off of it. And it will exchange itself in a reductive elimination to give us the final hydrogen, hydrogen product. So what we're finding is that the two hydrogens that were delivered across the carbon-carbon bond were delivered from the same face, SIN4. Hydrogenation is a word you've probably heard of in everyday life, right? Hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated fats and oils. Now, with the words that we've discovered through Orgo 1, thus far we've used terms like saturated and unsaturated alkanes. We've now just discovered this term hydrogenation for hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated fats and oils. These actually mean what they mean in organic. If you consider certain fats that have double bonds in them, they are unsaturated fats, which we know to be better for us if they have more double bond character. Specifically, we want cis fats. Those are better for us. Those typically come from uh, plant-based sources, while trans fats often come from um, animals. And, Fully hydrogenated fats are saturated in hydrogens because if your fat had a double bond in it, whether it was trans or cis fat, ultimately, if you hydrogenated it, you would have saturated your fat. And we know that saturated fats are not as good for us. Saturated fats are attainable through hydrogenation, so they can partially hydrogenate, just hydrogenate a few of the double bonds in the, in the long chain, or maybe fully saturate and get a saturated fat at the end of the day. If you want to read more about this, I have an article I can post. Here's some practice for you. Hydrogenate the following alkenes and show the major products formed. What happens when you're hydrogenating an alkene that's in a ring? This gives you some practice as well. And I want you to note that the last one on this page, C, has one major product. This is taking things a step up for you guys. Perhaps you might want to make a model of the starting material and try to, using your hands, hydrogenate and find out what the major product might be. The next SIN4 mechanism we're going to look at is called hydroboration. Now this one is kind of fun to think about. Why? I'm going to remind you about two reactions we've studied. We've studied oxymercuration with water followed by sodium borohydride workup. We've also studied acid and water. Either one, if you did the acid and water hydration or oxymercuration hydration, you're going to get the same product. You'll have added a hydrogen on the one side and ultimately the OH on the more substituted position. So I want you to just remember this, keep this in mind. Now we're going to look at hydroboration. Hydroboration 
It's a very interesting system. We're going to be using a borane species, BH3. And I want you to think about BH3 as it is geometry-wise. What's the hybridization of boron if it has three hydrogen bonds? Think about where it is on the periodic table. It has three valence electrons. So if it's bonded to hydrogen, then it's totally happy. However, it only has three electron domains around it. So boron, let me draw it a little bit better, is actually sp2 hybridized, naturally. It's trigonal planar, sp2. Okay, so what's going to happen is that we're going to think about the hydrogen and the BH2 as two parts of the landing ship for SIN4. Okay, which part, if I want to deliver a hydrogen, the blue one, again, it could have been any one, but the blue hydrogen and the yellow BH2 on the other side, the boron and the hydrogen are what are the two atoms that are going to land SIN4 across our pi system. Which atom, yellow or blue, is going to be less sterically hindered? Well, hopefully you recognize that the hydrogen is smaller. It's the smaller end, right? And we have some steric hindrance considerations. So one carbon has more steric hindrance with those two methyls off of it than the other side, which has two hydrogens off of it. So the way that I'd like to orient this BH3 molecule to deliver a boron and a hydrogen across my system is that I'm going to put the boron over here and the little hydrogen over on the left. So as the SIN4 ensues, the pi bond makes a new carbon boron bond. The boron releases its bond to form the new carbon hydrogen bond. Great. This is my SIN4. The hydrogen and the BH2. Let's take a look at how this can work using our hands as models. Let's take a look at the borane. As I mentioned, the boron in its natural, normal bond trend state has three bonds, no charge, but thus has uh, an empty p orbital, just like a carbocation. Remember in the last set of slides, we used a reagent called sodium borohydride. Understanding this borane as a three component system in its neutral state, I want you to consider what BH4 is. Boron is outside of its bond trend. It has four bonds. It's unhappy. So it has a negative charge. The counter ion is thus sodium. So this is an ionic salt that when you put it in solution, boron is so fickle, it does not want to have that fourth bond. So when you put it in solution, the boron kicks off one of the hydrogens so it can go back to its borane state. Thus, sodium borohydride is really BH3 with an H that got kicked off as a negative charge. This is your hydride. That's what we used when we worked up the oxymercuration, the H- as a nucleophile or base. Borane, though, on its own, BH3, is neutral. 
and it has an empty p orbital, so it can accept electrons. What I want you to see now is that the boring that we made here, our product, is neutral. And sometimes this is exactly the final product that someone wants, okay? But what I'm going to say is that this BH2 of the product is equally as reactive as my starting BH3. So if I had another molecule of alkene, my product can actually continue to do hydroboration. So this is kind of onerous to, to uh, write out. So I've repeated this here to show you that point. BH3 reacts in a SYN4 mechanism shown here to give us the product that I just showed you on that previous slide. But the product is equally as reactive with another alkene. So understand that there's two hydrogens off of this boron, right? And one of them can react and the other the whole this whole bh with the carbon off of its system is what is going to be the new reagent so your product becomes equally as reactive thus whenever you have these reactions you only need to use one third for every one molecule because your product is going to continue to um, re hydroborate. So every hydrogen on your boron is, is reactive. Even after you've made your product, that molecule can still keep going. So you don't just consider equivalency. You don't need it to be one to one when you're using BH3 because you have got three of those hydrogens on the boron. Each one of those can hydroborate. So the double bond reacts with the product, or you know maybe it finds the other BH3. Once all the BH3 is used, your products become the reactive reagents until, until you have no more double bonds left, right? So now your whole boron system, after a second equivalent of alkene is reacted, you still have one more hydrogen on there. It can do it a third time until you have boron on all of your carbons. So what does that do? Well, after you're done, after you have finished, you can work up this reaction using sodium hydroxide, so you're under basic conditions, hydrogen peroxide, and water. And what I want you to see here is that the boron that you put on the less substituted, less sterically hindered side gets converted to an oxygen. And the stereochemistry, so if you came in from the top face, it's not an SN2, you're not swapping it out. It's actually a rearrangement that allows the transition of the, bo the boron to the oxygen smoothly from the same face. So I wanna go back to this slide right here. And I wanna point out the, the, tough that's some, the, the thing that's tough to see because we see our SIN4 and it looks pretty straightforward. What was governing the SIN4 was steric hindrance. Okay, and then you're going to work up the reaction with sodium hydroxide and peroxide and water. And ultimately, the BH2 gets exchanged for an OH. Okay, let's take a look at this overall using our hands. Now, how does that happen? How does the BH2 convert to the OH and not lose the stereo, stereochemistry, the top face or the bottom face? How does it smoothly transition? Well, I don't want you guys losing sleep over any of this. 
So I'm going to cover the mechanism for how this happens so that you know it's not fairy dust and magic, but you're not responsible for writing out the entire mechanism for this system, right? Because this is, this is sort of an onerous thing to do. So first of all, the hydrogen peroxide reacts with the sodium hydroxide in an acid-base reaction. The sodium hydroxide deprotonates the peroxide, forming this nucleophile. Remember what I said about boron. It's sp2 hybridized. It does have an empty p orbital, so it's very electrophilic. It thinks it wants an octet. So it accepts a bond from the peroxide. Now the boron is negatively charged and it's kind of freaking out and saying, ooh, gosh, that was a mistake. <laughs> I wish I hadn't have done that. What could I do? Well, it decides to alkyl shift. Take one of the R groups and shift it over. You're going to have to kick out the OH as a leaving group. That's okay, though. You know why? Because... OH minus is floating all over the place in my solution. I'm Remember, I've got NaOH in my solution anyway. So the boron kicked off OH minus and is now having an, a, a borate ester, B-O-R. All right, well, let's repeat that. The OH... Um, oxygen of the peroxide attacks the boron. Fickle boron. Boron gets rid of its fourth bond and then goes, oh, look, there's another O minus. I'll react with that. Come on over. I'll accept your electrons. And the whole process repeats. Boron has such a short memory. Then it freaks out. I'm negative again. Oh no, what do I do? Well, it alkyl shifts. Pushes out another OH minus. Guess what happens next? Boron is now back to neutral. And guess what's floating around? <laughs> Another oxygen minus from the peroxide. And the boron is like a goldfish swimming around, forgetting that it just saw the same castle and it's excited again. Oh, I'll take you. No problem. You can see why I'm not requiring you to do this. It's just repetitive. The boron's negative again, four bonds, and it freaks out, and it alkyl shifts. But this time, we're going to do it with our system. So ultimately, we're here. We have boron. Oops. With all of the groups around it as a borate ester. Boron, oxygen, carbon. Boron, oxygen, carbon. So that's what happens when you hit those reagents. You can already see now, can you see just in the fact that we started with a carbon-boron bond, now we have a carbon-oxygen bond. So it doesn't take much now to get the reaction to release the boron. 
So what's going to happen is that um, the OH minus, because again, it, it's not going to get us anywhere. You can try it, but if you try to react with a peroxide, it's just going to be reversible at this point because there's you can't do any alkyl shifts anymore. There's no more alkyl groups off of the boron. So what happens is that over time you end up with sort of an SN2 exchange and ultimately it pops off every single one until you have O minus on all of your alkyl systems. So it does this until the boron has exchanged all of them again. Popping off your O minuses. And then you work it up. You work up the reaction under a little bit of acidic media. And you have your desired alcohol. So that is the reaction so you can sleep at night. Okay, how the exchange works. What are you responsible for? Oh, well, you're responsible for this. The sin for that we're seeing, governed by steric hindrance, and then understanding that the second step, the addition of sodium hydroxide and the peroxide in water will exchange the BH2 through a series of rearrangements to give you OH from the same side the BH2 was delivered. That's the bottom line. There are a lot of different hydroboration reagents out there. In fact, some of them only have one hydrogen on them. So you can see the boron is, they can bulk it up and really enhance the regioselectivity of these reactions. And in these cases, they have to add a stoichiometric amount. So you can't do one third, there's only one hydrogen. So you, these reagents, if you buy these reagents, the, the bonus for them is the fact that they're very sterically hindered. So they, they really only deliver it selectively from one side right? You're, you're only going to be delivering this once across a sterically hindered system. The hydrogen is going to go on the less sterically hindered side. The boron with all of its junk in its trunk, right? Like you're going to definitely line that up on the outer carbon with less steric hindrance for the SIN4. And because, there's, because the, the way of these are designed, you can only deliver one boron and hydrogen from the starting material reagent. So in, in these cases, you need a one-to-one -one ratio. You know, you can't hold back on the, on the borine. So we will see these reagents again in, in a very similar way for alkynes, okay? And we tend to like these very bulky systems when we talk about hydroboration of alkynes. Can you see why we might want to bulk it up a bit more in an alkyne scenario? Right now that it's linear in an alkyne, trying to um, favor one side over another, we don't have as much steric hindrance in an alkyne as we do in an alkene with two carbon groups off of, say, one side. So we, we actually need to make the borane system a lot bulkier in order to facilitate and have regioselectivity for these alkyne systems in order for them to work a little bit better. Otherwise, you get kind of a mixture of regioselectivity. So I'm going to have you do a few of these, okay? Practice um, what you get for the following scenarios. Provide all possible major products. And here's a few more practice problems with rings, and um, these are both for hydrogenation and for bromination, so you can get a little bit more practice under your belt for those. Okay, what other SIN4 reactions should we consider? Let's take a look at dihydroxylation. This reaction uses osmium tetroxide and again works it up with hydrogen peroxide under a SIN4 reaction. This is what osmium tetroxide looks like.
Wow. Again, we're dealing with um, a very interesting met metal system. We're going to deliver two atoms across the pi bond, and let's push the electrons. A new carbon-oxygen bond breaks the pi bond, giving it to the osmium, and the pi system of another osmium-oxygen bond breaks and forms the new oxygen bond. You end up forming this intermediate. And this intermediate, it's a five-membered ring, and it'll stay like this until you introduce uh, hydrogen peroxides. Or so there's, there's other different things you can um, use to work this up. But ultimately, what you're trying to do is um, have something that's more stable to the osmium react so that it'll exchange and pop off. You can kind of think of it like an SN2. We essentially want something to come in, whether it's the hydrogen peroxides, sometimes people use dimethyl sulfides or triphenylphosphine. You can use lots of different things to come in and it basically exchange off one of the oxygens. So it's usually in this 1B that we get the exchange and the workup with some acid to protonate gives you two oxygens, two alcohols, dihydroxyl, as your final product. And the OHs are both on the same side. This is more, um, I guess, obvious when you're doing a ring for dihydroxylation because ultimately your product here will give you top and bottom facial attack. Now in this case, what's the relationship between these two molecules? Hmm. Well, there are two stereocenters, but there is a plane of symmetry internally. So this is a meso compound. Therefore, these are actually equal. They don't have an antimer. So if you pancake flip it, they are indeed the same molecule. So these are the same molecule and you just get one major product for this case. You have to take it um, each example on its own. Another very similar reaction where you get the same product uh, is with potassium permanganate. Potassium permanganate looks like this. You can already see the similarities. Here's the only difference, but it adds SIN4. Slight difference, we're not breaking a pi bond here, but we end up with this very similar. So I know I'm using SIN4, we're not forming a four-membered ring, but we are including four atoms in the transition state across the carbon system. So this is more of a mnemonic than it is an actual four-centered transition state. As you saw with hydroboration, with the boron, the hydrogen, and the two carbons, we were forming a four-membered ring transition state. For these, it's more of a five-membered ring transition state, but SIN4 is a great mnemonic for this. In the workup conditions, sodium hydroxide, water, if we do it cold, again, this is like an exchange. We're simply exchanging in this workup in 1B so that we can obtain the O minuses. And then with um, 
quenching, a little bit of acidic workup, we get our final product. What would this have looked like if we had done it on a ring? Again, we have to consider both top and bottom side attack. So we get dihydroxylation on the top, we get dihydroxylation on the bottom, and we always should step back and consider what the relationship is. Both are possible. And so what do I get? I get, well, there are two stereo centers, but I have again, an internal plane of symmetry leading to this meso system. So these are the same molecules. So I get one major product. Is that always going to be the case? No. You have to just do the chemistry, take a step back, and figure out what the relationship is. But you have to consider both front and back or top and bottom side attack. Here's some more examples. The last reaction we're going to consider is called ozonolysis. It also follows a SYN4 mechanism. Now, how does this work? What you're going to be responsible for, for me, is the first step, 1A, that ozonolysis. But, you know, I hate causing you grief. I don't want you losing sleep over how 1B occurs, so I'll show you the whole thing. But I really want you to be only responsible for 1A. Why? Well, because the first step is where the SYN4 magic happens. Let's draw ozone. If you've never really thought about what ozone looks like, ozone is a charged molecule, but overall it's neutral. This is what ozone looks like. So you can see we're gonna add both oxygens across the carbon pi system. We can start our pi bond as the nucleophile, forming a new carbon oxygen bond, breaking the pi bond, giving it to the oxygen that wants its lone pair back. And then the oxygen that's negative on the end will attack. And this is all a concerted mechanism from one face. This is our SYN4. Providing us this ozonide. It's a, a malozonide. It is unstable. Remember we talked about um, how hydrogen peroxide is unstable. That sigma bond is very reactive and unstable. Be you just need some heat or light and that thing just breaks apart into radicals. Yeah, well, oxygen, oxygen, oxygen. <laughs> These guys are scary. They're explosive. They're shock sensitive. You don't want to mess with them. Okay, they're very unstable. Before you can do anything, right, this thing will actually self-collapse. So this is the part that you're responsible for. But just so you don't lose sleep at night, this highly unstable ozonide will completely decompose on itself. How? Well, you can think about it this way. Watch what my arrows do. Okay, the following decomposition ensues. I'm going to give you carbon 1 and carbon 2 so you can follow along. Here's carbon 1. It now has the double bond. I'll, I'll even color code these so that they're a little easier to follow along with. Kind of a fun mechanism to follow. Okay, so this oxygen is the yellow one at carbon one. It now has a new pi bond to carbon one. Carbon one to carbon two, that bond broke. Carbon two, which does have hydrogens off of it. Let me draw those in. The hydrogens at carbon two now have a double bond to the green oxygen. Okay. And then the electrons, oh, look at the carbon, um, sorry, the oxygen bond 
up here, he's still connected to the yellow. I didn't have any bond breaking of that bond. So, but it is now negatively charged because it gained those electrons. So these are the two uh, units that are decomposing um, into once that ozonide ensues. Now these decomposed fragments now are actually attracted to each other. So this is kind of cool. The negative charge of the blue oxygen is attracted to the electropositive carbon too. So what happens is, I'm just going to redraw these. Okay, we have, I just turned it on its head. I'll keep the blue oxygen in the same alignment. Carbon one. The blue negative oxygen is attracted to the carbon that's partially positive. And then that pi bond breaks and forms a bond between carbon one and the green oxygen. And then the pi bond breaks and goes into the oxygen here. Oh, I forgot a positive charge. The oxygen down here is not happy. It's got three bonds. Where does that get us? Oh my goodness, this is crazy. I have a new, not very happy system. <laughs> but it's better than the first ozonide, I'll tell you that. I at least don't have three oxygens in a row. Now I have two oxygens in a row. So I have a peroxide in the system with this other oxygen down at the bottom. So this is an ozonide and these are unstable. These are shock sensitive and explo explosive. So those you have to be careful with. But it'll actually, in solution, it'll stay as the ozonide until you hit it with some workup conditions, triphenylphosphine or the dimethyl uh, sulfide, something. But you just don't wanna drop this puppy. <laughs> They're a little scary. Okay, so now it sits there until you deliver triphenylphosphine or dimethyl sulfide. I used to use, I used to like to use the dimethyl sulfide. I know it stinks, but the more you oxidize sulfur, the less stinky it gets. So this is one of the few reactions that I knew would work. Why? Because I added something really stinky and as it got less stinky, I knew the reaction was working because the sulfur was getting oxidized. It's kind of how it works with skunks, right? You get a lot of that sulfur that adheres and, and sticks to the proteins on your body, right? And your hair and your, and how do you get rid of it? Well, you don't get rid of it. You just oxidize the sulfur so it doesn't smell anymore with that tomato juice or hydrogen peroxides. So what's going to happen is you can think about it um, as the sulfur trying to break up the yellow blue oxygen bond because that's your peroxide bond, that's a weak bond. So what I think the easiest thing to do is to just say, all right, the sulfur attacks one of the oxygens. And you end up with something like this. Whew. All right, we've got carbon one double bonded to the green oxygen. We've got carbon two, double bonded to the blue oxygen. And the sulfur is now double bonded to the yellow oxygen still stinks a little bit, but not like dimethyl sulfide, which smells like rotten eggs. The two things that I'm interested in are these two products here, the carbon one and carbon two. They are now carbonyls. Oh my goodness, how am I going to figure these out if all I'm responsible for is the SYN4 mechanism of the first step? 
all of the rest of this stuff. Phew, that's a lot. Okay. I want you to pay attention down at the bottom here. I got a little shortcut for you. It's kind of a cheat, I know. But we started with this carbon one, carbon two alkene. This is what I t used to tell myself when I was taking these exams is I would say, oh, ozonolysis. I'm going to karate chop. Bam. Karate chopped my double bond like they were two boards at a, in a karate studio and I pull them apart. So again, I have my hydrogens on carbon two. So I karate chopped, right? Karate chopped it, pulled them apart. Oh, and I, they're bleeding. Oh, they're bleeding. What do I do to stop the blood? Oh, well, you put an oxygen bandage on it. So then I would cap it with an oxygen. Ta-da! I have just made my carbon one, carbon two products. End of story. So that that's my little trick for you to, to do these pretty quickly is karate chop the double bond, tease them apart as if they were as if they could be, and then cap them with oxygens. Cap the cap the bleeding wound with those oxygens. Okay? You'll find that this trick is actually quite useful. Here's some practice for you guys to try. Here's some ozonolysis practice for you to try. Come on, karate chop them all and cap them with your oxygens. Okay, so you guys are going to give me those. Oh my goodness. We've reached the end of alkene reactions. There's probably more in your textbook, but we're not going to cover every single one. These are the major ones that I want you to know. Here's sort of a, I call these explosion charts. Looking at the middle, we've learned a heck of a lot of reactions in this chapter. I mean a lot. We've learned to hydrogenate. Oops. We've learned to hydrogenate a double bond. That means you're adding hydrogen, hydrogen across. We've learned to add an acid with different um, different acids and and if there's no solvent that's given we've added a halogen and a hydrogen across we've learned to hydrate using water in an acid or an alcohol in an acid to to make ethers or alcohols off of our pie system we've halogenated and added two halogens across the pie system hydrohalogenated Halo ether halogenated. <laughs> I mean, look at the different things that we have added across our pi system. Oxymercuration can add these. Peroxy acids can make epoxides. Hydroboration adds OH and H, but in a different regio selectivity than hydration does. We can open up epoxides. And that's interesting, right? We just, if you open up an epoxide, you get anti-addition overall because you backside attacked. Anti-dihydroxylation. So if I go from alkene to epoxide and then protonate the alkene, the epoxide with acid and then have water be the solvent that attacks in an SN1, I end up getting the OHs on adjacent atoms but anti to one another. Hmm, that's interesting. I've also just learned how to do cyclopropanations, right? I can, I can make a cyclopropane ring now. I can make that cyclopropane ring have halogens off of it. I can do Syn dihydroxylation using osmium tetroxide or potassium permanganate. I can cleave alkenes and form carbonyls. 
Wow. I have learned a heck of a lot of reactions. And you might feel like this um, far side comic. Excuse me. Uh, may I be excused? My brain is full. And I totally concur. This is a lot of reactions to know. Here's some more practice. In each of these cases, I'd like you to indicate how any of the following could be made from an alkene. So these are the products, and for each one, what alkene and reagents do you see them coming from? Okay, so this is great practice for you guys, given that we've come to the end of our journey for alkenes.